makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen tells a Bloomberg event that a strong economy is behind a surge in bond yields. This, as data shows GDP growing at its fastest pace in nearly two years. Tech optimism, strong results from Amazon, and an upbeat forecast from Intel boosts sentiment. European earnings continue to disappoint. Plus, NatWest plummets after cutting margin guidance as competition for deposits its heat up, while the bank admits serious failings after the controversy which saw it lose its chief executive. Now, welcome to the program. We have a number of stellar guests actually joining us. Let's kick off the European markets map. Again, a lot of everything we're seeing also has to do with oil trading with a firmer bias as Europe comes online, again, bolstered by some of the mounting tensions in the Middle East. Now, we've spoken to a lot of traders who could be tactically positioning themselves to minimize risk into the weekend, and then we continue looking at earnings. For the moment, European stocks, one hour into the trading session, pretty much unchanged. Now, there are a couple of things that we really need to talk about. Amazon on, adding some $40 billion in post-market reaction to earnings. Again, that eases some of the negative sentiment around tech. Uh, the Nasdaq actually pointing to a higher open this morning. The other thing we're looking out for, so let's go uh, through some of uh, these great charts that our Dan Curtis put together. So that's Amazon. We're just talking about uh, the $40 billion extra that they put in post-market yesterday. Then let's also get on to European companies having a pretty tough time in delivering sales this quarter. That's our next chart. I think that's the 10-year uh, U.S. I'll get on to the 10-year U.S. Again, seeing a slight lift today after yesterday's drop. If you look at the seven-year auction, seeing strong demand, Yellen emphasizing higher rates are from stronger growth. And then finally, Brent. This is a five-day chart. Again, Brent getting a lift uh, below $90 a barrel as tensions in the Middle East uh, seem to be ratcheting up. Now, here with us to talk about the U.S. economy, to talk about uh, crude, to talk about inflationary pressures, PGM Fixed Income Chief European Economist, Catherine Nies, and Eddie van der Velt from Bloomberg Markets Live Team. So thank you both for joining us. Eddie looks a bit like a croupier, but actually this has to do with the rugby, Catherine. So I have to apologize on his behalf. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. The, the market at the moment seems to be still focusing, of course, on this higher for longer idea, tabletop for interest rates. But then they have all of these big unknowns also coming into play. What does it mean? What are you looking at for as an economist? So I think there are two uh, risks here, and they're both at opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, we've seen, for example, the U.S. GDP data that came in. If I, if I look at that on a like-for-like -like basis with uh, what the European PMIs are suggesting, if you crank them through, is quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth of 1.2% in the U.S. versus, say, a minus 0.2 quarter-on-quarter uh, -quarter for the euro area. So a yawning gap between what we're seeing in economic activity in the U.S. and in the euro area. Now, I think the base case is that in the U.S., near-term indicators are slowing, so they, too, are expected to be on pause, like what we saw with the ECB. But the two tail risks here are that there's a lot more to run when it comes to the U.S. economy, which could spill over to higher, longer-term rates in Europe, or, on the other side of that, that Europe really starts to cool rapidly and fall off. And, Eddie, what does this mean for earnings? Yeah, look, I think earnings are becoming more and more important, right? I think as we come to the end of the, of, the, of, the, of the hiking cycle, we're looking more and more towards earnings to discern whether or not there is a, there is a, there is a macro signal to pick through from, from earnings. Because, you know, up until now, the Fed has really been driving markets across the board for Europe, for everywhere else. And now, as, we, as, as the Fed becomes less of an input directly into markets, you're looking at earnings and you're looking, you know, towards, I think particularly the, the latest sets of, sets of earnings from, from big tech, where, where we've seen this, you know, split between uh, Alphabet struggling on the one hand and, 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 and Amazon doing quite well on its, um, on its, on its AWS business. Mm -hmm. I think you are seeing the companies that are innovating and you're seeing that this is turning into a stock picker's market. Um, and, and, you know, we may get a sharp correction here, but if we don't, then I think people are going to look towards the big winners, the, the companies that are innovating to see where they take their money. Yeah, uh, Catherine, if you go back to inflation, I wonder whether the, the strong U.S. economy could import inflation at the same time where we're uncertain where the price of oil goes. 
that uh, uncertainty about energy prices is something that Lagarde talked about uh, during the press conference yesterday. I think we need to remember that the inflation drivers in U.S. and Euro area are really quite different. U.S., it's all about the strong economy. In Europe, it's really about these higher energy prices. Mm -hmm. Now, we're seeing those past energy price rises fall out of headline inflation, yeah. but they're taking a lot longer to work their way through core. Uh, now, even in the absence of further shocks, I think, you know, we have to accept it's going to take some time for inflation to fall back in the euro area. Maybe we'll be within striking distance of 2% by this time next year. But I think it's very plausible we could see further energy price shocks in Europe. And if that is combined with higher rates coming from the U.S., that is really putting the ECB in a very challenging position. So Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, also was at a Bloomberg event. Here she is. We're seeing yields go up um, in most advanced countries. Part of the increase in yields, uh, I think, is simply a reflection of the strength of the economy, the notion that interest rates will be higher for longer. If you look at fixed income, where I mean, where does it go? Does it just go ever higher? I know the ten-year touched five percent. I think it is possible that there are more tailwinds on the U.S. economy that rates could go higher. That is uh, a plausible scenario, and that could have spillover consequences uh, not just for Europe but global bond markets in general. That uh, you know as, could be very challenging. L Lagarde did mention this. She talked about spillover effects of higher rates that are not reflecting your area macro fundamentals. Um, so I think that is that is one scenario. But another one, of course, is that the euro area economy is perhaps weakening uh, and rapidly so, and that the ECB will get pushed, you know, in the early part of 2024 to have to cut rates. And Eddie, I guess underpinning everything is, is there for the cost of money. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think, I think we're getting closer and closer in, in the U.S. in particular. I think the, mo the most important thing the market should be focused on right now is, is that point of dis disinversion, right? I think uh, markets are getting very close to that uh, two-year yields and 10-year yields, uh, just 10-year yields just shifting above uh, the, the two-year point. And it's uh, coming at a point where, you know, 10-year is also just sitting just below 5%. Yeah. So I think it could be quite rapid. I think we could see a lot of people positioning on either side of that and then positioning around the 5% level and that you just see a lot of, uh, you know, momentum carrying it through as it moves above that. And that will then feed through into the rest of the market because, because really this bear steepening that we've, we've seen in markets now is not really mar anything that anybody who's trading today is familiar with, right? This inversion via, the, via the long end. We just haven't seen that before. And I think that that will definitely carry through into Europe as well. All right, thank you so much. So you're supporting the All Blacks, right? For yeah, rugby? definitely that, not. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just quite grateful you didn't show up in a rugby shirt. So good, good job. No, definitely not. I think we can take them. I mean, by one point, by one point, you, you not been only so close. I mean, France you know, was fantastic. France, sometimes you get a couple of England. points. Sometimes you get a couple of calls going against you. I know there was a there's a little bit of controversy in that game. The England game could have gone against us. But look, if you're going to win a big tournament like this, you need the call sometimes to go your way. You need a little bit of luck. And uh, yeah, but also because you beat France, I wish you luck on Thank Saturday. You for, uh, the final. There you go. <laughs> Bloomberg's M Live. Eddie Van Der Velt, uh, of course, joining us, and Catherine stays with us. I promise. We won't talk rugby. Amazon has delivered a beat on third quarter net sales. Revenue at its cloud computing unit, AWS, however, just narrowly missed. Now, the chief executive, Andy Jassy, says the business is stabilizing and generative AI would boost the unit tremendously in the future. Let's get more from Matt Bloxham now from Bloomberg Intelligence. So, Matt, what from Amazon earnings really stood out to you? Yeah, well, I mean, definitely that resilient uh, Amazon Web Services um, revenue growth, 12%. Um, uh, year on year, so pretty much uh, in line with expectations. But alongside that, the profitability, both of that unit uh, and for Amazon as a whole, you know, operating income was 45% uh, above where the street expects it to be. So huge performance, and that's a reflection of a lot of work they're doing on, on efficiency in the, um, the kind of core online uh, retail business, but also scale coming through in AWS. And, and as you pointed to there, you know, really confident outlook from uh, the CEO uh, about... Um, AI and how that's driving uh, the future growth opportunity for AWS uh, and how they're tapping into that. So I think that's given investors confidence uh, that they can hit the top end of that guidance range that they talked about for the next quarter, which is essentially where consensus is already.
So on Intel, Matt, investors quite happy with the results. Are sale, is sales growth just coming back in general? Yes, yeah, so, so, so Intel's a slightly different story because it's a turnaround story now. Uh, they had better than expected results in, in this quarter, but actually their, their revenue is still shrinking. Uh, but um, their guidance for Q4 does point to the, um, a revenue growth for the first time in, in quite some time. Uh, and they're seeing you know, um, a recovery in inventories uh, with their key PC demand customers. And they're kind of also optimistic uh, about their data center business, which has been facing some headwinds uh, because um, NVIDIA has been stealing their thunder essentially in the data center business because NVIDIA chips have historically been a lot better for, for a lot of the demand coming from AI. But again, that they're developing a product roadmap uh, to be stronger in that area. So yeah, optimism in terms of the strength of the PC market uh, and their ability to, to grab some of the AI momentum, uh, proving a more optimistic forecast than people thought for Q4. Matt, thanks so much. Matthew Bloxham there from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, don't miss our interview also with uh, the chief executive of Intel, Pat Gelsinger, on Bloomberg Technology just after 5 p.m. London time today. Now, coming up, the ECB hits the break on rising interest rates, but Christine Lagarde warns the inflation fight is not over yet. So we'll have plenty more on that next. And this is Bloomberg. has held rates for the first time in more than a year, pausing a cycle of 10 back-to-back -back hikes. Now, speaking in Athens, following the decision, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, warned there's still work to be done to bring down inflation. We are determined to ensure that inflation returns to our 2% medium-term target in a timely manner. Based on our current assessment, we consider that the key ECB interest rates are at levels that maintained for a sufficiently long duration will make a substantial contribution to this goal. Well, Bloomberg's Euro Area Economy reporter Alexander Weber joins us now. So, Alex, does this mean that the ECB is done raising interest rates? That's certainly what analysts and investors expect, but uh, Lagarde refused to confirm those expectations yesterday. Uh, on the one hand, the ECB really sounds increasingly confident that the 10 rate hikes they've enacted so far are having the desired impact. Lagarde cited strong transmission in the banking sector, but also in the real estate sector on uh, business investment. Um, the ECB also mentioned a weakening economy and sounded uh, more confident that inflation is really coming down. But they do have to remain on guard, mm -hmm. not least because of conflict in the Middle East that could push up uh, energy prices again. Mm -hmm. On that, Lagarde gave a relatively balanced view. She said that um, it's still being analyzed how that would affect the euro area economy and whether it would have the same impact as uh, the shock after the Ukraine war, for example. And that's not a given because interest rates are now much higher. Um, but still, it, mm -hmm. all of that was not enough for Lagarde to rule out another rate increase. So did, I mean, did we hear anything about when rates could be cut? Also here, uh, Lagarde refused to engage in any discussion of that. It's, in, it's not in the ECB's interest to ease financial conditions at the moment. Inflation is still more than twice the target. And uh, Lagarde also mentioned that the wage bargaining, for example, is going to run well into uh, 2024 which will create a lot of uncertainty around the inflation outlook. Um, so there's even the December projections are probably not going to be enough for the ECB to call the high point and engage in any discussion about cuts. So expectations are for cuts to happen in the middle of next year. That's still some time away. And it seems like we will have to wait uh, for some time for the ECB to engage in any discussion on that. Alex, thanks so much. Alexander Weber there from Athens. Now, still with us, Catherine Neese, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. So, Catherine, we were talking a little bit before about what we heard from Lagarde, your interpretation of it. But w when will we start talking about cuts? So uh, I think the ECB are really going to want to see two things before cuts are even plausibly yeah. within the frame. The first of that is I think they really want to see core inflation coming off 
month after month. Now, we've seen core inflation start to come off. I think the expectation is we'll see a further softening in the data uh, later out this month. But they'll want to see that baked into the data over the coming months. I think the second thing that we're hearing from the ECB, particularly from the chief economist, is that they want to see wage growth easing. The early part of 2024 is an important time for wage settlements in the euro area. So I think the combination of a consistent fallback in core inflation together with signs that wage growth is easing would give the ECB confidence to at least begin to contemplate uh, potentially cuts. But, you know, that I don't see that happening until the earliest possible time is Q2 of, of next year and, and probably later than that. How difficult, Catherine, is it overall to actually set monetary policy for Europe at the moment? Because you have different speeds of the economy, which we've kind of always had, but also, you know, the politics of it makes it harder in, in individual countries. Well, the macroeconomic mix is, is, is really toxic. I mean, we're seeing a rapidly uh, easing economy against a backdrop of still high, uncomfortably high inflation, where it's plausible to think that we could be hit by further shocks, all of which are pointing to the upside on inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, President Lagarde talked about uh, physical effects of climate change potentially pushing up on food prices. We've already talked about geopolitical risks potentially pushing up further on energy crisis. Europe is already feeling the effects of a cost of living crisis. Uh, you know, if, if, if that has more to run, obviously that is, is going to be very challenging. Mm -hmm. So that combination is just, you know, exactly not what um, central banks uh, like to be facing. So in terms of key data points for Europe, is there anything that you, I mean, apart from like the usual euro area uh, ones, is there anything that you look out for for a significant downturn or I don't know whether it's lending or credit card repayments that we should worry about? So this bank lending survey that we had out, uh, I think it was just earlier this week, it really is showing that these interest rate rises that the ECB has already put through are affecting credit conditions. They are affecting the real economy in the euro area. European households, firms already responding to that, pulling back on demand for investment um, and, and consumption in sort of larger items with, within Europe. Uh, and it suggests that there's more of that to come. Now, my base case is that uh, things will stabilize, things will look better mm -hmm. as we get into 2024. Real incomes should pick up. We should see some of this next generation EU pick up. But I think there is a risk here that the economy uh, is just cooling a lot more rapidly than we're thinking. And so that would be uh, what I would be looking out for in particular in Europe. And there's also this divergence, right, in spreads, for example, between Italian VTPs and Bunds, and I don't know whether that's just going to continue. Well, here I think the latest policy meeting um, was was a positive surprise. Um, it, I mean, it was pretty vanilla in terms of, you know, people were expecting the ECB to be on hold. But to the extent that there was a surprise in the meeting, it was that they did not talk about uh, the possibility of bringing forward the end of PEP reinvestment. Mm -hmm. And so at the margin, I think that should be supportive of peripheral economies like Italy. Uh, that said, the, you know, all of Europe has had to hand in their homework, uh, if, if you like, in terms of their draft budgets. And uh, Italy does have, uh, you know, a fairly substantial uh, deficit that they're projecting for next year on the back of a big one for this year. And so I think, you know, some of this widening and spreads as some policymakers there have said is, is probably warranted. But, you know, it's, it's a very fine balance. If they can work through this period, I think, you know, the base case is kind of muddled through. But there are, you know, there, there are off ramps yeah. here. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Catherine Nisser, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Coming up, NatWest plummeting after cutting its margin guidance. We'll look at all the big movers after reporting earnings next. And this is Bloomberg. back now these are the main movers that we're watching out for let's start with NatWest now NatWest shares are plummeting after a cut its margin guidance this is just the latest UK lender to warn that higher interest rates 
are stirring competition for uh, deposits. Now, executives at NatWest also pointed to customers shifting into fixed-term accounts to take advantage of better rates, which means that the bank spends more on interest payment as well as a potential end of the Bank of England rate hikes that have buoyed earnings on deposits for the last two years. The other things we're watching out for is Sanofi that's down 15%. Um, so big plunge also for Sanofi after a surprise forecast for lower profit next year overshadowed some of the optimism that we saw on a plan to spin off the consumer health division. Remy Contro, this is um, the cognac maker. This is also falling to a three-year low after the French distiller cut its annual sales guidance, citing weaker than expected U.S. demand for its high-end spirits. Again, it said uh, organic sales fell by 15 percent and Equinor. So Equinor is actually the only one at the moment that's getting 2.4 percent in our biggest movers. Uh, the third quarter profit beat expectations. The company's trading unit adapted to changes we understand in the global oil trade prompted by Russia's war in Ukraine. Coming up, a warning from Iran as its foreign minister says the U.S. will not be spared if the Israel-Hamas war turns into a broader conflict. The very latest next. This is Bloomberg. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen tells a Bloomberg event a strong economy is behind a surge in bond yields. This, as data shows, GDP growing at its fastest pace in nearly two years. Tech optimism, strong results from Amazon and an upbeat forecast from Intel boost sentiment. Earnings in Europe continue to disappoint. Plus, NatWest plummets after cutting margin guidance as competition for deposits heats up. The bank admits serious failings after the controversy which saw its lose its chief executive. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the U.S. says it has hit two facilities in eastern Syria it believes were used by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard in what it called the self-defense strikes. Well, Bloomberg Middle East and Africa anchor Yusuf Gamaldin Knight joins us. Yusuf, good morning. So take us through the latest. Hey, Francine. So basically, this is the U.S. making sure that uh, it sends a clear signal to well, pretty much anybody who thinks that uh, U.S. assets can be targeted without any response. And so this in self-defense to some of the events that happened uh, in the October 17 set of developments. But the thing I want to point out is that the U.S. De Defense Secretary also said that it's unacceptable and it would not go without a clear U.S. response. And the Iranian side, for their part, I mean, they also made it very clear that uh, what they're seeing as genocide uh, in the uh, Gaza Strip is not going to go without a response. So there's a lot of tit for tat, and I think it's important to highlight that this happened along the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. And ultimately, what you saw as well is the Iranians playing with their proxy influence, right? So specifically uh, Hamas and others. We understand that the uh, deputy foreign minister of Iran met with one of the senior Hamas Politburo members in Moscow just within the last few hours, Fran. Right? Yusuf, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Din, our Middle East and Africa anchor. Now joining us now is Tina Fordham, founder and geopolitical strategist at Fordham Global Foresight. Uh, Tina, as always, thank you so much for joining us. It feels like there has been a possibly qu quite a big escalation, actually, since we spoke last 10 days ago. Yeah. Where are we now? I think escalation is the, the right word. And we had put Middle East escalation risk at the top of our sort of watch list compass because it seems quite clear, at least as I read the signals, that Washington has been able to put some amount of pressure on Israel uh, some use the term slow walk, but to, you know, kind of talk big about uh, a, a retaliation for the October 7th terrorist attacks by Hamas. And we see a lot of efforts around limited incursions, limited strikes and everything else. But what I think is really powerful about the recent events is what's happening from Washington. 
uh, attacking those positions in Syria and sending that message to the leadership of Iran that it's not going to allow these strikes on U.S. forces. Uh, Tina, and I understand this is delicate, but if there's not a ceasefire from the U.S., is there going to be a backlash worldwide against Israel and actually the U.S. support of some of these strikes on Gaza? And this is what is really horrendous about the calculus of war, because from a military strategy perspective, a ceasefire is an opportunity to rearm, and there are, there's a very deep academic literature about how ceasefires prolong conflicts and cost more lives over time. Now, as humans, when we see these devastating scenes of, of deprivation, of, of death, and uh, you know, issues of lack of, of water and everything else, how can anybody say that there shouldn't be uh, a ceasefire? Or This is why European leaders use the term humanitarian pause, because they understand that a ceasefire suggests let the adversaries, um, you know, re-equip and, and rearm. This is an incredibly difficult situation for leaders to balance because this, the scenes and the human toll is is enormous. But if they, I guess if they don't balance, is this and we're I don't know if it's eco chambers in social media, but if because of the death and destruction and frankly killings, if this is not balanced. Is, there, is it going to be harder to do geopolitics? Is it going to be harder yes. to, to just go into foreign affairs, basically? The ricochet effects are, are many. And one of the things that, that I've flagged is this, you know, the, the strong actions to defend Israel probably hurt Biden with the American left at the polls um, because of, of the extent of, of polarization. And it is incredibly difficult to, to find some kind of humanitarian third way in this environment where there are so many interlinkages and where, of course, sending signals to Russia and China and Iran, yep. all of which are involved in both the Ukraine and the Middle East conflicts, yep. is really paramount. Uh, Tina, so we had these U.S. military attacks on two Syrian facilities, which they say were linked to Iran. Like, w what's the best policy for U.S. foreign affairs right now? Do they need to go hard to, to show that I Iran can't be playing games, or is there another way to, to basically de-escalate this? I think this is out of the, the, the playbook um, that uh, Biden has to use. You know, I remember... Uh, talking to Madeleine Albright about this, the late Madeleine Albright in the past, and she said leaders have three tools at their disposal. There are only three, diplomacy, sanctions, and conflict. What we are seeing is Iran, through its proxies, using these sort of gray zone attacks designed to inflict damage without prompting a full-scale military response, and the U.S. is showing that it's serious. It won't allow it, and where I would highlight, I think there's a disconnect in thinking of market participants is that the old kind of you know response is to say well the US won't do anything in the run up to elections that will drive up oil prices and i think that old calculus is really wrong in this case the US has almost no choice but to stand up um, to uh, attacks on its own forces plus we've seen the the move of two US strike carriers that they are serious I've just come back from Saudi Arabia, and actually in the corridors of the FII, a lot of the talk was on those two carriers, the fact yeah. that if, the, if, if somebody were to play games or something were to happen, even you know, a small boat put in one of those, then we're in trouble. And we have seen that happen in the past. It, you know, it was 15 years ago that there were um, attacks on, on U.S. forces and battleships in the Gulf. Um, markets have short memories business leaders see big opportunity at the Gulf. It is notable that there were virtually no cancellations to the so-called Davos in the desert. I think that there has been uh, an effort to, to really try to localize the, the military conflict between Israel and Hamas uh, and uh, you know, assume that it won't widen, but that relies on a lot of restraint from a lot of actors for whom this is an opportunity to gain advantage. What's Putin's role in all of this? Sit back and watch. Because it plays his advantage. That's right, because it is distracting attention from the war in Ukraine. He is hoping for a change of government in the White House in 2024. That's only a, you know, only a year away if you are a leader who's been in office 
for over 20 years, as Putin has. Um, and he feels time plays to his advantage because conflict in the Middle East increases the likelihood of war fatigue. Mm -hmm. Another twist since we last spoke, of course, is we now have uh, a leader in the U.S. House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. The White House will, uh, Congress will, will try to put through separate aid packages for the Middle East and Ukraine. I actually think those chances are no. better now, of passage better now than they were before. And Tina, last time you were on, so 10 days ago, we were talking about how it's quite unusual that the U.S. was also leaking their outreach to China to deal with, with yeah. the conflict in the Middle East. Where's China on this? I think China is a bit dear in the headlights, having, you know, uh, pushed for a strategic role um, and, you know, reaped the benefits of that uh, with the Saudi normalization with Iran. Um, China also now having to deal with its own internal considerations, you know, this, the, the story going around is whether China is taking a, a, a great leap backward instead of the old Maoist forward. So I don't think we should expect much in the way of uh, statecraft uh, on this conflict from, uh, from China. They've been very limited in their remarks. Tina, thank you so much. As always, terrific briefing. Tina Fordham, their founder and geopolitical strategist at Fordham Global Foresight. Now, also making news this morning, China's former premier, Li Keqiang, has died less than a year after stepping down from overseeing the world's second largest economy. He was the ruling Communist Party's second most powerful man before retiring in March. Li suffered a sudden heart attack in Shanghai. He was 68. And the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi is reported to be due to meet with President Biden today when he visits the White House. It's a move that could lay the groundwork for a meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi next month. Now, earlier, China's top diplomat spoke with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Ties between the world's two largest economies have improved since the U.S. shot down an alleged Chinese spy balloon earlier this year. Coming up, back to earnings and NatWest shares plunge after the UK lender cuts its margin guidance and admits serious failings over the debanking scandal involving the former politician Nigel Farage. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, Morgan Stanley's incoming CEO says that investment banking will lead the next business cycle. Ted Pick spoke to Bloomberg alongside the current Morgan Stanley chief executive, James Gorman. I personally think the U.S. has dodged a recession. Uh, I think the Fed is very close to being final within probably 25 basis points. Um, we're starting to see activity. Look at the Chevron deal we just announced the other day. I mean, phenomenal. So we're seeing activity in different sectors. It's, it's coming alive now. So, no, I think the next couple of years will be great. But what I care about is over, over the really long run. When we, when we set about on this journey, we weren't focused on a quarter. And if the stock takes a dip in a quarter, I say that's kind of good news because we're buying back stock. And every share you buy back, you're retiring a dividend. So shareholders who hang tough are getting a 4.5% yield. And we're buying back stock, and the stock's cheap. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a good situation being but medium term, no, I think, we're, I think the firm is going to do great. Ted, what are the biggest challenges for you as you navigate this environment? There's just so much opportunity. We're, we're definitely in a new paradigm. Interest rates are going to be higher for longer, and the world's gotten smaller, which, need, which, which means the clients need advice. They need in the wealth and asset management space. They need in the institutional space, our corporate clients. And we're going to have lots of activity around those clients. So I... I, I just want to make sure that we are completely aligned in the business strategy we have in place. It's something that James has painstakingly put together for 14 years. The market knows what we want to do, so I, I'm incredibly optimistic over the next couple of years. You've long been the number one in equities trading. Lately, Goldman has surpassed Morgan Stanley in a couple of quarters, while J.P. Morgan and Goldman have been faring better in various forms of M&A and underwriting. Do you have a plan to be number one again? Listen, we have some great competitors, as you know, in the global investment bank, in equities and fixed income, and then across investment banking. We're focused on being number one. We want to have the right people in place. We've been investing for the next cycle. That next cycle is going to be investment banking led. And it means that in equities, we want to be one or two every quarter as we have been for the last decade. We have a fixed income business. We restructured. It's now a top five business. And investment banking is going to lead the next cycle. 
There's going to be a lot of M&A consolidation. It's going to be across industry groups. The world's gotten smaller. There's a new cost of capital. Uh, we want to be a leader, a global leader in all those spaces. Now, James has hinted before to the possibility of more mergers and acquisitions for Morgan Stanley moving forward. You've already done some very transformative ones. You know, do you feel, Ted, that it's a matter of time in the CEO seat before you can do a significant deal? Or do you feel like you can jump right in? Well, I think we now have done three major acquisitions over the last 15 years, all of which were in James's vision. Smith Barney shortly after the financial crisis, E-Trade at the dawn of the pandemic, and the Eaton Vance. Those are three major integrations. We like what we have. You know, the business strategy is in place. Let's, let's execute on what we have, keep the strategy in place. We always talk about acquisition candidates, but that's, that's off into the future. Morgan Stanley, incoming chief executive there, Ted Pake, with the chief executive, James Gorman, speaking to our Shanatli Bazak. Now, NatWest shares plummeting after the bank cut its margin guidance as competition for saving deposits grow. The UK lender has also admitted to what it called serious failings on how it handled Nigel Farage, including how it treated its confidential information. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. So, Tom, I was going to ask you what stands out in the results, but actually there's quite a lot of bad news. I imagine that's what's standing out. Yeah, I think it's that NIM guidance which is really sending those shares down. You know, we've seen that at Barclays as well. Basically, the UK retail market, there's a lot of competition for those deposits, and that is going to be bad news for banks because they're going to be able to keep less of those higher interest rates. So, you know, the market's really given those shares a hammer in, and I think that's a sign, basically, they think, gosh, to keep those deposits, you're really going to have to pay up for them. So, so what about, you know, the saga or the scandal? What's come out of that review? Yeah, interesting review from the law firm. Basically, they concluded, look, there was nothing unlawful about the way they debanked Nigel Farage, but there's a whole litany of shortcomings that are outlined. And, you know, it's basically all been in the press before, but seeing it in black and white, it's just a reminder of just, you know, how badly NatWest really handled this. So, you know, I think that's probably feeding slightly into the share price as well. You know, it's a question over governance. This saga keeps on dragging on. And certainly Nigel Farage isn't letting go. He's come out today and said, you know, let's see what the FCA, who are now looking into this, say. Let's see what the uh, ICO say. Um, and he's clearly still, you know, uh, going to pursue this. So wh I, I don't know whether, wh I mean, what this means for Alison Rose, who's stepped down, or what this means for NatWest. Yeah, I think for Alison Rose, the big thing is her pay package. Will the bank try and claw some back? You know, we've been pouring through their remuneration report. And, you know, we're expecting a decision on that pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in total, that package is about £10 million, we think, on our analysis. And, you know, I would think that some element of that will be clawed back, which will be the big bit of news. My sense of NatWest, I don't think there's sort of a big fine coming. I don't think, you know, as they look through it, there's sort of any kind of you know, wrongdoing that the regulators take attention to. But what it is a big problem is this massive dent to their reputation. And, you know, we were just talking about how those deposits seem to be quite flighty. This is not helping because, you know, the general public reading this go, why would I leave my money at NatWest if this is how they treat some of my customers? Thank you so much, our Tom Metcalf there, who oversees all of our banking coverage here in Europe. Now, some of the other news we're watching, sources have told Bloomberg that the United Auto Workers put forward a new proposal to General Motors, similar to the tentative agreement they have with Ford. Now, they said the UAW president met with GM's chief executive yesterday. No tentative agreement has been reached yet. Both sides are said to be close on multiple key issues. And Sam Bankman-Fried struggled on the witness stand in a rare dress rehearsal of what he wants to tell the jury in his trial. It's the first time in months that the world has heard from the FTX founder as he attempts to defend the fraud charges against him. Well, Bankman-Fried spent almost three hours trying to convince a judge to allow him to testify about the role that FTX lawyers played in the lead-up to the collapse of the crypto company. Coming up, Rich Beyond Her Wildest Dreams, how Taylor Swift made it to the 10-figure club. We look at just how much she really is worth. This is Bloomberg.
the conversations that matter, the insights you need, this is a pulse on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Taylor Swift is now a billionaire. The ERAS tour has propelled the pop star into the very limited ranks of recording artists who have built a 10 figure fortune almost entirely from music. Bloomberg Originals has more on how her financial success was created. It's official Taylor Swift is a billionaire. Welcome to the ERAS tour. Her Eras tour alone is a party, generating hundreds of millions of dollars. It's a multinational conglomerate with the world's most devoted customer base and an ultra-charismatic CEO. Swift has made her fortune almost exclusively from her music. Bloomberg estimates Swift has made $125 million over the years from record sales. We estimate that her total income from streaming is $175 million. The biggest part of her earnings is undoubtedly her concert revenue. We estimate that Taylor nets about 35% of the ticket sales as profit, about $500 million from touring over the years. Her tours, her record sales, and streaming royalties are all earnings, but she also has assets, including her recording catalog. We estimate that her catalog is worth about 400 million. Then, of course, there's her actual property. That includes um, a condo and an estate in Nashville, an estate in Los Angeles, a large apartment in Tribeca in New York City, as well as a summer house in Rhode Island. The total value of her properties is about 110 million. Subtract her expenses, taxes, staff costs, and so on and you get a net worth of $1.1 billion. And you can watch the full Bloomberg Originals documentary online and on YouTube for subscribers as well on the terminal and at Bloomberg.com. Now let's have a look at some of the earnings that we're watching out today. And at West, actually, those shares are plummeting uh, after it's cut its margin guidance. Latest UK lender to warn that higher interest rates are stirring competition for deposits. Now, NatWest executives did point to customers shifting into fixed term accounts to take advantage of better rates, which means that the bank actually spends more on interest payments as well as the potential end, of course, of these uh, Bank of England rate hikes that have buoyed earnings on deposits for the past two years. I'm also looking at Sanofi down 15 percent. Now, those shares plunging after a surprise forecast for lower profit next year overshadowed optimism over a plan to spin off the consumer health division. Stock, of course, down 15%. I have to say the plunge is wiping out some 19.5 billion euros from market value. The other one we're watching out for is Remy Cointreau, uh, falling to a three-year low. This is after the French distiller cut its annual sales guidance, citing weaker than expected U.S. demand for its high-end spirits. Again, Remy and other spirit producers are facing uh, this slowdown in demand for their premium drinks, particularly in the U.S. after sales boomed during the pandemic. And then Equinor, one of the biggest gainers, uh, gaining some 2.5 percent. Up next, we'll have plenty more on the markets. We'll have plenty more, of course, on oil and Brent. A full roundup of your market news. Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger in London, Manus Crane in New York, and this is Bloomberg.